I had a brilliant report on Irish radio yesterday about a conference taking place in Dublin in relation to defenders of human rights. 321 people were reported to have been killed last year defending human rights. The conference was attended by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Defence of Human Rights, Michelle Force. He called on Ireland to play a bigger role in calling out these human rights violations and also suggested that more people sign a proposed treaty on the defence of human rights at the United Nations. I also found out later on that day that the new head of BP is a man called Bernard Looney and he is Irish. There's been a rise in the number of environmentalists who are being killed or attacked for their human rights work. That's according to the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights Defenders, Michel Forst, who was in Dublin this week for a conference hosted by Frontline Defenders. He said private companies, particularly in the areas of mining and exploration, are emerging as the main threat to human rights defenders. And the UN wants to take Ireland I, wants Ireland to take a leading role in encouraging foreign companies and governments to sign up to a new treaty to protect human rights defenders. Last year, 321 human rights activists were killed for their work. I spoke to Michel Forst earlier and began by putting it to him that it's a dangerous time to be a human rights defender and asked him why record numbers of them are now being killed. Well, as you say, that's a very dangerous time for for defenders and um, the recent report uh, that um, frontline defenders uh, made public recently uh, is only for me the, um, the tip of the iceberg. In fact, we don't know the exact figures. So do we see an increase or not? I don't know. Uh, we see an increase in the recorded uh, figures. It sounds like Michel Forst of the United Nations is looking for better data to find out whether or not the numbers of people who have been killed whilst defending human rights have gone down or up. It also sounds as though there's proposed legislation in relation to human rights at the United Nations. This from Reuters. A change of leadership at BP. Bernard Looney is to replace Bob Dudley as CEO when he retires in February. The incoming CEO is no stranger to the oil giant. He took charge of BP's oil and gas production or upstream operations in 2016. Just as the sector grappled with the aftermath of the 2014 collapse in oil prices. The Irishman's energetic management style was quickly felt as he spearheaded cost-cutting and digitalisation. When the business press refer to Bernard Looney's pivot to digitalisation, what in fact they're referring to is the 10-year contract that he signed with controversial military data intelligence firm Palantir. Looney has helped lead BP through some of its fastest growth in oil and gas production, with output rising by around 20% since 2016. The same period saw the acquisition of BHP's portfolio of US shale assets this year for $10.5 billion, BP's biggest deal in three decades. When the reporter says shale gas, what she means is fracking. BP are fracking massively in the United States of America. They currently have operations in Libya, Oman, Brazil, Egypt, Iraq, Angola, Russia, not to mention plans to possibly go back to Iran. As CEO, he will be charged with continuing to adapt BP to the transition to lower carbon energy as pressure from investors to meet climate change targets grows. If you want to protest about the way BP operate, you could either engage with the company and say, oh, please, could you stop investing in oil? Or you could say, I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm pulling the money out. What this woman is saying is that investors are putting pressure on BP to meet climate change targets, as in, please continue investing in oil, but please also demonstrate that you're making money from other areas. Bob Dudley will step down as CEO after the company's full year results in February. He was appointed to the top job in 2010, following the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. If there were such a thing as justice, there's no way a company like this, which had done the biggest spill in America's history, would be allowed to continue doing business. But of course, BP were known to have been supplying fuel to the US military. And furthermore, its links with the government are so strong in terms of lobbying that there's no way that anybody could get in their way. The term used for this type of corporate criminal that escapes with impunity is too big to jail. Companies like this can commit crime, get fined and carry on. And ultimately, their bosses get pay rises and their shareholders all get paid. Dudley led the company through near bankruptcy, 
after it caused the largest oil spill in US history and through an oil price crash four years later. Dudley has enjoyed overwhelming support from investors, although a majority of shareholders opposed his 2016 pay package, forcing the company to slash it by 40%. This next clip is taken from Friday morning's BBC breakfast show. Nagaman Chetty introduces the business correspondent and he starts talking about the relationship between Facebook, its proposals for encrypting not just WhatsApp, but Instagram and Facebook messages and Messenger, and the relationship between the US, Australian and British authorities who claim that Facebook need to allow them access to everybody's messages. Tell me if you think there's anything sneaky about the way in which they present this information. I believe that it's actually a form of persuasion and concealment than it is information. Britain has joined the United States and Australia in raising serious concerns about plans by Facebook to encrypt all messages sent on its services. Ben's got more on this story for us now. Tell us. Yeah, it's an interesting one, this, because it's about trying to find a balance between our right to privacy, mm. um, and especially in the wake of all those data scandals where it turned out that a lot of social media firms, Facebook in particular, uh, was accessing personal data for financial gain. Now, it's trying to find that balance of stopping that happening, but at the same time allowing security services, international police, for example, to be able to access messages should they need to to stop criminal activity on those social media platforms. Now what Facebook is proposing is to make the messages that we send on its messaging service encrypted. That basically means they get scrambled so you can't read them unless you've got the code at either end so it means it protects them when they're sent over the internet. Um, and it does that already with its uh, WhatsApp service. It now wants to roll that out to Facebook and to Instagram as well and that's raised concerns. For WhatsApp though that's almost been a selling point hasn't mm. it that this, this encryption end to end so I'm not quite sure why the objections are coming through. Yeah, for, uh, WhatsApp's had it uh, almost since conception, actually, to make sure that those messages are protected now. And remember that Facebook owns Instagram and mm. WhatsApp, and it says we're just going to roll all that out to all of our services. It's not done it up to now, but remember it's been in the firing line, given all of the concern about access to our data. Uh, and they say, look, this is just the next step for them to make sure that customer data is safe. I want to bring a statement to you that they've issued this morning. They say end-to-end -end encryption is increasingly used across the communications industry and in many other important sectors of the economy. They go on to say, we strongly oppose government attempts to build backdoors, that's basically access that would be granted to, say, the police, because they would undermine the privacy and security of people everywhere. Now, it's interesting because this just comes at a time when the UK signed a deal with the US to be able to access information directly from tech firms rather than having to go through a very convoluted legal process. In theory, that would make it easy to get in just a matter of days rather than weeks. But the big issue, of course, is that if that stuff is encrypted, you just can't get hold of it. Ben, thank you. Remarkable that towards the end, he says that the Facebook proposals to encrypt everything comes just days after the US and the UK sign an agreement in which they will be able to access people's messages. When did they sign this agreement? Did the BBC report on it? No, they did not. Who was the person that signed it? It was Pretty Patel. And where was she when she signed it? She was in America. What actually happens is later on, on Friday, they show that Pretty Patel was talking about this subject. They interview her very briefly, but they do not reveal the fact that she had gone to Washington, D.C. to sign the treaty. It's called the Cloud Act, uh, the American uh, law, and she's just signing on behalf of the U.K., now, nobody over here really knows about this, and the BBC did very little to publicise it. So it's very interesting the way in which they tell us everything from the Facebook perspective, and even talking about the link with Law and Order, but they don't tell us that Priti Patel was in America. The only reason why I know about it is because a friend retweeted the Department of Justice tweet which said Priti Patel was over here, and they showed the photograph. So there is footage of her doing it, it's just that the BBC kept it from us. The UK has joined the United States and Australia in raising serious concerns about plans by Facebook to encrypt all messages sent on its services. Now, Home Secretary Priti Patel has co-signed an open letter to the company's chief executive, Mark Zuckerberg, arguing that the move will make it harder for the authorities 
to fight crime, particularly child abuse. Facebook says it's consulting with child safety experts, governments and technology companies to keep people safe. Encryption is creating those spaces, those spaces for terrorist individuals, terrorist organisations, child abusers, the people that are seeking to do harm to others, um, children, individuals, and our own countries and our national security. So I would really urge Facebook to engage with us in active dialogue, um, which is something that has not happened thus far. That's why we have issued this letter. That was Home Secretary Priti Patel, who was part of the Vote Leave campaign which itself manipulated Facebook in order to tell lies and win the Brexit campaign. Facebook published something last week saying that lying in political adverts was something that they're not going to prosecute. That's quite interesting. Obviously something that will come to the advantage of Priti Patel. I also saw that uh, Twitter, if you register to advertise on Twitter, then you're not allowed to talk about abortions and you need a license to do political adverts. I don't know if the same is true for Facebook. I understand Facebook has allowed abortion adverts or at least did not do very much to stop them. This apparently is quite controversial in some spaces. There is of course a Facebook Supreme Court being set up. I think Facebook don't like that term. I think it's called the Oversight Committee. Uh, Nick Clegg has, who's the vice president of Facebook, he has commented on it on the Facebook blog uh, about three or four weeks ago. Priti Patel has also launched an investigation into child abuse, but actually on this occasion she's investigating the police for having investigated suspected child abuser Harvey Proctor and uh, extra MP and other uh, military and conservative party uh, former ministers such as Leon Britton and Lord Bramall. It's interesting because if you look at it from the perspective of retribution, she's really getting the police back for having bothered to investigate what appeared to have been particularly credible allegations, not from this man, Carl Beach, who has obviously gone to jail for 18 years for making things up. But the fact is those rumours really were there. And it is a very, very clever game that the Westminster Tories um, particularly the far-right Tories like Priti Patel have played because what they're doing is they're trying to make it seem as though there has never been any paedophilia in Westminster at all and that, everybody knows, is completely untrue. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this recording. I hope we meet again. <laughs>